Good morning. Um, just briefly to introduce myself, Trevor, owner and founder of Rio Max. And uh, I'm always frustrated by the fact that the rancher and the rancher's margin is always under such pressure. Um, and in the whole supply chain, there's the, the packing houses that are making large amounts of margin and then extreme pressure on the men and women in the ranching community that work so hard. Now, because that's who we serve, that's kind of where my heart is and that's why my frustration is, you know, that, that's what drives it. Now, I'm gonna introduce somebody on this call which can maybe show us some different ways to do stuff that can alleviate some of these frustrations. Somebody that's thought out of the box, somebody that's challenged status quo um, in, in the ranching industry. And I'd like to introduce Bob Howard from Desert Mountain Grass-Fed Beef. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Trevor, how are you? I'm doing well, uh, thank you. How are you? Oh, really good. So I guess I just should just start talking. I'm Bob Howard, I live in Hammond, Idaho. We've always lived in Idaho. Um, we've ranched here actually 80, 90 years now, I suppose. But uh, we, uh, we're we always looking for a, a way to pay our bills better. It wasn't through being glorified or anything, it was through poverty is <laughs> what forced us along. Um, we were raised on the cow-calf ranch and the cow-calf business, specifically since the mid-70s, has been really hard. And uh, so as time went along, we got into the natural beef business and it was a better niche market. And it fit us pretty darn good because we can run outside and we don't have a lot of issues that a lot of people have. But what I soon started realizing was that there's a population or you have to do what the consumer wants. And I think it's a fascinating fact that if you want to be paid a little better, you need to do what the consumer wants. And so as time goes along, we joined a co-op called the Country Natural Beef Co-op. And it was a really good marketing tool for a ranch. But the thing that drove us to where we are today was the consumer. So my wife and I have probably interviewed 20,000 I like to say ladies, but it's consumers. There was ladies and gentlemen in front of meat counters. And wow. they, uh, they like the part where we own the cattle from birth till death and they like everything, but they really, really wanted a grass fed product. And so about 10 years ago, we started going down this path. And I'm gonna get ahead of myself and I'll get behind myself and that's just the way I do things. So we started to develop this grass-fed line and oh the commodity market was really good four or five years ago i mean beyond belief there was no need to be excited to do anything <laughs> in fact it was it was to a point where you could almost buy a ranch first time in my life <laughs> with cattle anyway so as we went along though it was always in the back of our mind that we would have to be in a niche market if we're going to survive at the size that we are. And I say that, but there's another way to survive. And that's you get up at five in the morning, you get your computer on and you follow everything that goes on the board of trade until one o'clock and you can survive in this market. But I guarantee you, you won't be able to take a day off. You won't be able to have a stops <laughs> and it can eat you alive and it'll consume your life and it did mine i mean there was just no way around it and it was fine we were making money but if you looked out on thursday afternoon when you go do something at 10 30 you were probably making a mistake so <laughs> i wanted to get away from that <clears throat> and so anyway we started in this grass-fed business and a fellow came to us about five years ago now, right this time of year. And he was gonna, well, it was this time of year and it was because of the high price cattle. 
because his other partners had sold their uh, yearlings because they were worth so much money they didn't make them grass fed. And so I'm gonna back up just a little bit more. So about 10 years ago, we thought maybe that half Hakushi cattle would eat really good off grass because they are easily marbling Japanese breed. And if you feed a straight Akaushi for two or three or 400 days, they're 98% prime. So our hope was that we would, we could have these F1 crosses that would eat good off grass. So now I'm gonna move back to about four or five years ago, this fellow calls and he wants some steers. And we were making big steers anyway. And he said, can I get about 30 of them steers? And we talked for a couple of months and they said, yeah, it'll be fine. And so, it was about July, four or five years ago, we butchered the first one of them half Akushi cross steers and he ate just like candy. <laughs> it was just, it was fascinating how for 30 months we tried them at the Boise store every month, we'd go in there and cook and they ate about the same. The marbling wouldn't be quite as good or maybe better, but the product ate really good. So I'm gonna kind of go forward a little bit. So Ed and I formed a partnership and we thought we could do that by ourselves with an LLC. And we could, but it was the same thing, almost identical as the commodity market. Right. Because if you don't have any volume or size, you have to be uh, hauling cattle to the kill plant, gathering up product and going here and doing this. And then our other problem was uh, to get enough uh, decrease in cost at a kill plant, we had to have some volume. And the other thing, when we're in the red meat business, we have to have year round supply. And so if you're in the fresh beef business, you have to kill 52 weeks out of the year. In the winter, the demand's not as good, so you don't kill as many in the summer, it's tremendous. But anyway, after about a year or so, I went to Ed and I said, Ed, you know, I was in that country natural beef co-op and it would fit this model really, really good with the right people. And so we started having meetings with folks that I knew and folks that Ed knew and, and sitting around in a circle. And we sat in a circle for a real good reason. We don't want anybody to be able to hide behind anything. We want, <laughs> that's true. We want to have everybody's opinion heard. And so every person has to state their name in the circle and they all have an opening question, but you can say anything as that goes around that circle. And we do the same thing to solve problems. We throw the problem out in the middle. We start around the circle. We talk about it. Everybody has an opinion. About two thirds of the way around the circle, some quiet person will have the right answer. It won't be a noisy guy like me. Wow. <laughs> Fascinating. If that doesn't work, then we may break into smaller groups and work on the problem more. We may even table it for for a long time and keep working on it. But we're 100% consensus business, and it was huge to understand that process in order to keep our program uh, together. Because nobody, no matter how big the producer, how small, everybody has an equal voice. And the reason for that is to get the voices in the room and probably have the solutions and not just let the alpha male talk them down. <laughs> it's a hard concept to get it within your mind to do those things. I mean, it, it, it takes a while, but it's a really good system for people that fit the system to do to run their own company. And so we'll go a little bit forward now how the company works and runs for other people. And that was one of the founding thoughts in my wife and I's mind was that we would share this with anybody. Anybody that wanted to learn this, we could help them. We don't, they don't have to be part of our co-op. They can start their own co-op, they can do whatever. But the reason that the co-op works that we have is it's self-financing. So everybody still owns all of their own cattle. And actually Desert Mountain on the day of harvest takes possession of those cattle at the kill plant. The other thing that Desert Mountain doesn't do is we never harvest anything that isn't sold. So we don't have any, we do have a little bit of frozen inventory now because we're starting this e-commerce deals and I don't know. <laughs> the cash flow on it isn't very pretty. But then, <laughs> then uh, we actually, my wife and my daughter and I, and we contract the Desert Mountain to be production and marketing for them. 
but it's just a plain contract. We get so much per head and that's just, that's a cost that's already in there. But Desert Mountain runs off of the money of the cattle. So in the meat business, it takes about 45 days to get paid for the meat from the day they're harvested. And it doesn't matter who has it or what happens. It's an interesting thing and I never realized that all grocery stores have the money that the meat brought before they pay for it. And it's that way everywhere. Wow. It's because it takes, we haul the cattle in there and in two weeks, it takes two weeks to get them bagged and boxed and everything. And on the day you send that, you, you invoice the people, but nobody can pay within two or three weeks. And lots of our deals on two weeks, and but lots of companies are on 30 days. So now you're six weeks from harvest and all the meat is gone. <laughs> it's just a fascinating fact. And that's why the Backyards Act had to be, has to be so stringent because there's right. nothing left after six weeks. So anyway, what Desert Mountain did was for a payment schedule is we don't pay for any cattle and for 60 days. And I say we, but it's a co-op. I have nothing to do with the money or anything. And in 60 days, the co-op pays about 70% uh, of what we think the value for the year for the cattle will be. And so, in 60 days, the rancher gets paid 250 on the hot hanging weight. And then after another quarter, we keep running the business on this money, paying the bills and keeping things up and running. We may pay another 25 or 30 cents on the hot hanging weight. And on October 1st, and we stopped our fiscal year on October 1st, so that the, the, we could square up for the taxes for the end of the year for the ranchers. On October 1st, we zero out Desert Mountain. Desert Mountain has no cash as of October 1st, so that it isn't a taxable entity. But every rancher gets paid all of the money for his hot carcass weight, except for, well, he gets paid for his share of it. We have to pay for the harvesting and the delivery and the marketing and all those things out of those carcasses too. Right. And that system, it cash flows pretty dang nice and it's it works pretty good. But the true thing after you're in it for a while, you start to realize that you're completely vertically integrated. And right. so we're more vertically integrated actually than Tyson because we raise these cattle on these ranches ourselves. We don't contract out this or that or that or this. And we don't get paid for a year on some of that money. That's how vertically integrated we are. But at the same time, if, and we're kind of going through one of those stretches right now that maybe we need to get a little more money out of these carcasses for these ranchers. We have the ability to do that because we have the say in how we do things. And we just have to set together and collectively think of how to do this or how to, to decrease our input costs. And this other thing that we did as a niche marketing company is we targeted a concerned consumer. And so we can actually ask for a little more premium, but it's still tied to the commodity market. You can't be over 30 or 40% over the commodity market and make it work. And then the other thing we do, we try to be really good partners with our uh, retail partners. And we talk about pricing once a year. And we try to set a price and, and live by that price, both of us for a year. And so this, through this COVID deal, it's been a huge boom for our stores because we have not raised the price. But before the COVID deal, we were higher priced than everybody. But it's something that we have to leave alone so that everybody stays whole through the whole deal. Um, there's about 24, 25, maybe even 28 ranch members today in Desert Mountain. And, and we run that every Monday morning. We have a conference call at 6 a.m. for an hour. We talk about the meat business for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we talk about the business of what everybody wants to talk about for the next 45 minutes. Wow. Go ahead. Well, Bob, I, I'm, I'm intrigued, first of all, that, um, you know, I think you and I have talked before, the fact that you're so free to share what works. And I think we would, we would say the same thing. The more you share with people, um, it, it, you never come out wanting. <laughs> I mean, 
you know, some people just keep everything close to their chest and and uh, that's that's their deal. But I, I think, first of all, I, I would love to just show that I, I really respect the way you, you, you're open and you share. And I think that's what's led to your success. Secondly, I love the way that you are so consumer driven and but yet at a grassroots level, you've got the circle. Um, and I think that can be a lesson for any ranching business or any business, certainly for our business, the way you spoke about the quiet person. And, and I can echo that 100%. Sometimes you have a quiet person that doesn't speak because they don't like to speak. It doesn't mean they don't have the answer. So, you know, what, what you're doing is you're getting the most out of the people you're working with because you, they've all got a voice. And I, I, I love that. And then being consumer driven, what, what we call it in our business is we build our business around the needs of the people we serve, which is essentially the same thing, the concerned consumer you spoke about. Um, and I think to step out of the commodity uh, humdrum, I think we've got to think consumer and think the, of the producer. And what you've done is this integration right from the, the grass roots all the way up to the, the, the plate. Um, so sorry to interrupt, but I, I just, I, I love the sort of the, the principles I'm seeing running through this thing. Bob, go ahead. No worries at all. So what we really say in that circle is the combined uh, brain power of the circle is way more intelligent than any individual within it. There's just no way around. It can't be. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe just listen. It's just the way it is. But the, the thing that I realize and I think that it's hard for ranching communities to realize is we're in a business to raise the protein for an end user. And it's so fascinating to me to see what folks want to do. Folks want to gather together and have a voice and do better. But it's really hard when there's that many pieces in the puzzle. And so I'm sure everybody knows about the cattle business, but the cattle business has about four or five sectors in it. And every sector has to be profitable at some time or they couldn't stay. So there's the rancher, the feeder, the packer, the grocery store, and the delivery systems. But what we're able to do with Desert Mountain is we can take all of those systems and combine them as one so that we are all the time, we should be all the time profitable because of the seg each segment has to be profitable, just like everybody knows the Packers right now are making lots and lots of money. But we're our own Packer, we just contract harvest. At different times, the cow calf guy will be making all the money, but we're still a cow calf guy. And where we're all those pieces, even at 10 or $15 a head profitability, it really helps to the bottom line. Right, right. So do you think um, with the challenge of COVID, the reality and, and these packing plants, I mean, obviously there, a lot of them are coming back on now, but it's kind of exposed or, or made everybody a lot more aware of the, the, the food chain in America is dependent on these big packers, which can close overnight due to a, a disease outbreak like COVID. Um, my question for you is, do you think this is a trend we will see more and more as people sort of take take the reins of their supply chain? Or, or where do you think this thing is going to go post COVID? Boy, that's a wish I had the answer to that. That'd be easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. What I don't know is how long the consumer is going to re remember those things. People have pretty short memories in their pocketbook. They like to be, they don't like to spend a lot for their food. And I think that's a fascinating thing. 
Uh, they've told me that there may be as many as 10 new mid-sized packing houses in the works in the United States for the next two years. It'll butcher between 1,000 and 2,000 head of harvest between 2,000, 1,000 and 2,000 cattle a day. And I kind of wonder if that isn't going to happen because there's so much volume of cash in the packing business right now and you can't keep cash. Yeah. The impact system won't let you keep cash. <laughs> you can keep it, you can just keep a small percent of it. So I'm not sure that that won't incentivize more packing facilities. But I don't know though, is back to what the consumer will actually remember and stay. Will they say, no, we're never gonna get our medication and our masks and our ventilators from the foreign country again forever? I would hope they do, but I don't know. <laughs> I've seen that for quite a few years that that probably wasn't right to send all of our stuff overseas to get made. And yeah. It's a big trip on a boat. I don't know if anybody realized it, but the stuff that's coming for Christmas has to get on the boat next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. it, it you realize the, the distance. But, you know, we have a saying here that people buy on emotion and justify it with logic. I mean, it should be the other way around, but it ain't. Um, I think what what you guys are doing is connecting emotionally. Like I've been on your website, Desert Mountain. Anyone that's watching this, I would recommend you have a look. There's, there's such a strong element of the um, emotional connection you got families and you know it shows the families and you 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 just get this good safe feeling that that you know where your food is coming from and, and i think that's that's a trend people might forget what happened in covid <clears throat> covid-19 but i don't think they'll forget some of these fundamental things that you guys are building off of and, and i'm not here to recommend grass fed beef to the world necessarily what i'm here to endorse with uh, what bob has done is somebody that's refused to just accept status quo and somebody that's thought outside of the box in, in in other words looking at a way to take the take the steering wheel again and take control instead of just being a victim of a commoditized market so um having said that I do recommend that if you're watching this, that you do visit um, Desert Mountain Grass-Fed Beef, because I think what will intrigue you is that the story is deep. The story is about people, it's about land, it's about the, um, the grass, the soil. You know, it's, the, the story is a lot more than just a packaged rump roast. <laughs> you know what I mean? When you look at that that beef in the supermarket or online, like you guys are doing now, online store again, an example of of uh, innovation. It's like you, you're buying your way into a story that is has the foundation of good salt of the earth people. And it, it just changes the whole game, Bob, I feel. It changes the whole game from just buying. How many people buy from a grocery store in the cities and they don't really know where their food comes from? They don't know what a beautiful ranch looks like. They don't know what a family, um, a ranch family looks like. And and you, you've layered that in. Can you speak to that? Well, this internet thing has really, really helped us get our story across for years we would go to the grocery store and cook and visit with the consumer and we did that once or twice well about four times a year at each store and of course we can't do that now with this covid deal we're just not even gonna take a risk of giving it to anybody so but with the internet and what's happened while everybody's been sheltered is they're really starting to look at it and what we try to tell on our site is the truth and what we really think we should be telling is the truth about the soils and the carbon 
And so I've been 18 months trying to figure out how to get this story completely across and out because the concerned consumer should be concerned about the air they breathe. We can talk about anything, but the air is the most important thing you have. Yeah. <laughs> you can't do without oxygen for very long, can you? <laughs> no, if you think you can, put your head in a plastic sack. <laughs> See how that works for you. <laughs> but, and I think these ranchers and these cows have that answer if they'll pay attention to what's going on and, and then sort out all the baloney. Everybody has an angle. There's no way around it, no matter how you look at it. But the truth is, is that, and I'll just get into Desert Mountain a little deeper. Green growing plants are the only thing that can get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Oceans can, but just to, at their level, they're full. And carbon dioxide, dioxide will last in the atmosphere 200 years. So <laughs> I don't have any idea why we aren't way more concerned about these things than anything. And so when a cow or a steer bites that green growing perennial grass off and it regrows. It doesn't go to seed right then, it continues to sequester carbon into those soils. And I think that that is the biggest story that we could ever tell because people realize that the, for years I fought the word climate change and on and on. But after studying that quite a while, because of this internet, it's actually just about uh, the displacement of the carbon. It's not rocket science. <laughs> the carbon was stored in the soil and now it's in the air. We need to get it back in the soil. Back in the soil. Yeah, and and so the ranch, can... the ranch is the best mechanism to get it back in the soil. Right. And we can get a lot further into this, but I'm not going to torment or badger any part of anything. But what I do know is grass is the first thing in the spring to start growing and start sequestering carbon and the last thing in the fall. And it does its job the whole time all the way through the system if you don't let it go to seed. If you let it go to seed, then it starts emitting carbon. What you see in plants is so interesting that you can't even imagine. Most people don't even realize what they see. When a plant's green and growing, it's sequestering carbon. As soon as it gets some yellow strips in it, it's starting to decompose and, and release carbon. <laughs> okay, okay. So that... yellow, it is standing there and as instant you see any gray, that's the release of carbon back into the atmosphere. So that's why it's so important to have the cow as the center of this whole picture. Because not only is well, the, cow, the cow eating down that grass so that it can regrow, but it's also putting the manure that basically the natural fertilizer into the into the soil to keep building the soil biology. But the manure is doing its feeding biology. Is actually what it's doing. And the cow saliva they found actually helps increase the microorganisms in the soil. I didn't know this till just the last three or four months. A cow produces 45 gallons of saliva a day. She keeps most of that inside of her, but some of that's being slobbered around on the ground to help the microorganisms grow and do all those things. And it's, it's just such a fascinating circle of what goes on in reality. But the other fascinating thing is when God made this planet and he put Adam and Eve on here, it was perfect before we started fixing it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very it's so fascinating. You can't imagine. <laughs> very you know, well said. It. This needs help, you know, and we just need to, to observe. It's like a forest, it sequesters carbon, but 80% of the carbon's above ground. I didn't know that until we started learning about carbon off of my phone. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's, we're getting quite a ways off the subject, but that's truly what we're about is from the soil to the consumer and the consumer back. And, and we buy things from the consumer, what they build and all those things, it's a big circle. And we right. truly believe. Well, I like, I love where you're going with this, uh, Bob, because the story on grass fed beef may be hard for people to grasp. They may not understand the, the additional health benefits, the fact that it's all natural, no hormones, no antibiotics, and the fact that it's, it's um, fed and finished on, on grass. But when you get into that next level up, talk about being consumer centric, 
when you start start talking about the air that we breathe, <laughs> we all the, now we're talking a much bigger ecosystem. And I think I think that's a great story. It's not a story; it's a reality. And and I think that's what's going to continue to connect with the consumer we serve. You know, our job at at Rio Max is selling to ranchers and helping ranchers in this whole journey. But really, you know who our ultimate customer is? It's the same, the same one that you have. If people stop eating beef or people get disconnected from how this whole ecosystem works, this is, it directly affects us. So I, I'm just as passionate about this story as you are. I'm just not as smart. <laughs> no, you're too young. <laughs> <laughs> the truth of life is that God and Christ are the only stable things and the rest of this is shifting paradigms within your mind. And you just learn yes. and you learn every day if you're, if you're willing to learn. Yeah. It, yeah, it's been a fun journey. And it is what it is. <laughs> well, uh, Bob, I really appreciate you sharing this with us. And, you know, I think the whole... Uh, carbon sequestering could be another um, webinar that could go on for hours. And I truly believe that it's at the base of our whole story, a anybody's story that's in ranching. Because life, life yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you see bare ground, you should be scared to death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it goes back to the, you know, Lewis and Clark journals where they spoke about the buffalo herds and the, the grass that was saddle high, you know, and then the buffalo herds moving through and and consuming some of that grass and and disturbing the soil as they went and, and opening up for those seeds to get in there. And um, I, I think we forget, like you said earlier, how it was created and how it was before we started fixing <laughs> it was perfect before we started fixing it yeah. yeah it's really odd to me that that many europeans came to this pristine environment to fix it <laughs> yeah yeah well well bob um to wrap up would you have any uh, words of inspiration for anybody that has not yet started this journey you know let's say just average rancher joe he's he's kind of a victim of the the tight uh, margins and and the commodity commoditized nature of this market would you have any words of of inspiration you've you've said to us you've got the experience and the smart so let's let's uh wrap this thing up be glad for what you'd say <clears throat> i think the most important thing for ranch families to do is get together, maybe not just with ranch families, but with neighbors and stuff and set in a circle without anything between you and, and just listen. And I think it would help the mental health and the health of the ranching community if every small town would do that three times a year. And just, just start in there and just have a, a open discussion and have a facilitator that won't let someone talk down to someone else. I think the ranching communities could learn so much so fast and they wouldn't have to have people with PhDs running it. Everybody in that ranching community has a PhD in some form or another. And they just, they need to have communication with, with other folks in order to get those ideas out and think things through, I think better. That's, that would be my suggestion to anyone. You don't have to be in a co-op, you, you, but you have to, I tell folks I spend about 325 days a year in a Dodge pickup by myself. That dash just doesn't have much feedback. No matter how much we talk, still has the same get out. So anyway, that, all right. That, that's well, really helpful, and that, that's inspiring. I think it gives anybody hope watching this. Of before you start changing your ranch, you've got to change up here. You got to change your mindset and you got to be willing to listen. And I think that's a, a great message for 
for our company too um, that we, we, we have a saying and it goes like this, the, the day that we stop listening to our customers or the people we serve is the day that we start going out of business. And uh, we're, we're growing and we're continuing to be rancher centric, but I think this uh, message that you've given us today is um, very powerful. So with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you, Bob. Thanks sure. for sharing your journey with us. And uh, we will, um, again, for any viewers, I do recommend you take a peek at Desert Mountain Grass-Fed Beef website and get to know this, the, the people behind this journey. You can look at Bob right now, but there's a lot of other folks, like you said, in this in the circle. And I think it's an inspiring journey um, for all of us. So, so Desert Mountain <clears throat> and our grass-fed business is... Um, the, one of the huge assets is the farming community that we graze cattle in. And for the good of the whole, which means our whole community and all of people actually in society, to not have those guys included in this conversation would be craziness. They, <clears throat> we've been working with one farmer for, for six years, and this year he grazed desert mountain cattle for 10 months on different ground of his. And he farms about three thousand acres or so him and his sons but he sees the value of desert mountain to have a a shoulder season for his farm and actually he's double cropping lots of his farm with our cattle and so it's created another income without any more help and and it's been good for him it's been good for desert mountain it's a symbiotic relationship yeah, and it's yeah. the way that it's supposed to be in in agriculture, in life, in years. Everything should be symbiotic or one of them will have to go away or both of them if they aren't symbiotic. So I just want to acknowledge that the farmer part of our grass-fed business we, is so important that you can't, it's hard to even imagine. But it should be on the thoughts of every rancher's mind to be symbiotic with farmers because Ranchers don't grow much finished feed of e at any time. We can in Idaho from May to October, but the rest of the year, it has to be produced on farm ground. Right, right. So um, when you talk about the symbiosis, um, I, I get that side of it that you're buying feed from him for the winter. Now, you're running on the flip side, you're running cows on his land. Is that right? Right. We're actually fertilizing that land and trampling the deal in, raising the carbon for him, doing all the things that his land needs. And actually the saliva is part of the deal that those cattle have to graze and bite and pass that saliva around to get the microorganisms in the soil to stay healthy. One of the things that Chris prides himself more than anything, well, the one farmer, all of them pride them things on lots of these things, is the amount of uh, the count that he has in his soils. And I was just there two days ago. <laughs> and lots of these folks have had trouble with their beans crusting. They're planting seed beans here in this part of the world. He said his night crawlers are breaking the crust <laughs> on 200 acres. Yeah, wow. I said I've raised them. They're doing, a, they're doing us a lot of good. But all of those things need to have the involvement of livestock in order to do that. You take the livestock out of the picture, it doesn't work. Yeah, it's just fascinating. <clears throat> and then on the same deal, we were down there loading cattle two mornings ago, and he had half of the field worked. And by that night, he had his that late season corn planted in that field. And by the next morning, he had half of the field watered with his pivot. So there was a green growing thing on that land all winter, all spring. And now he has to wait two or three weeks to get the photosynthesis going back but nothing ever stopped producing on that land. And it's so healthy for that land. It isn't like black land in big river bottoms. It's kind of sandy, gravelly ground. But he is, he actually grows the most bushels of corn anybody in Idaho. Wow. With less inputs. <laughs> He's run some tests. Some folks, some folks uh, told him he could do better if he'd do this and that. And so he just gave them a half a pivot and he farmed a half a pivot. And he had about 15 more bushels for $250 less cost per acre. <clears throat> and plus he's stacking enterprises on the same land 
Right, um, and so, he's able so, to keep his crew working. Yeah. Right. So so there's a there's an economical benefit for everybody in the symbiosis, but more importantly, you're you're setting up that land for the next generation. If if I'm hearing you right, so the cow is fertilizing the cow is stimulating the microbiology in the soil from right. from the manure and from the saliva. Healthy microbiology in the soil, you can always, um, I guess the night crawlers you talk about are really the, the easiest way to measure the health, right? How healthy soil is. They're one of the ways, that's for sure. Yeah. That, that's one of the ways, but uh, and then I never get this right. Rhizomine, rhizomycal fungi is the other thing that is so important and so important to have the cattle there because it actually will send different uh, minerals and elements to the plants that need it. And it can be over a thousand acres that those plants can symbiotically help each other. And without cattle, the, the rhizomycal fungi doesn't survive very good. Right. It's just so and so fascinating that you can't imagine it. But it's for and it's for everyone. I mean it's the other thing that the cow does is stimulates the roots of the plant by the way she wraps her tongue around the plant the, and tears the grass off. There's a stimulation that goes there that they can't replicate with the machine. And wow. so yeah. <laughs> I've I've heard a lot about soil health and the symbiosis but i've never heard that one that, that's that is a real eye opener and, and you can just yeah. see it happen yeah yeah and then what happens next that if you can leave some feed the sunlight hits the plant everything just keeps exploding but if you don't bite it off it goes to seed and then the whole thing stops it just becomes dormant as soon as the seed stock goes up plants become dormant because they've lived their life so anyway nothing to it trevor <laughs> there's nothing there's nothing to it but there's everything to it and a lot of us are right. missing this um you know you talk about we, all are. we aren't yeah. ahead of anybody we're, just, <laughs> yeah. we're not downgrading anybody we're just trying to share information of what we know well that's it um sharing information and educating and and being a guide in this industry i think is important because a lot of this stuff is overlooked bob completely overlooked now, right. just we're obviously we're in the business of of um, supplements, you know, as far as your vitamins and minerals. And a comment I get a lot, Bob, is that they don't want to people, folks don't want to use a mineral because of its negative spinoff effect on your soil health. And I'll explain that. Dr. Spears from North Carolina State University did studies to show that sulfates and oxides, which are, we don't, we don't use them in our key minerals, our key trace minerals, but they are widely used, probably 98% of minerals, like cattle uh, mineral out there is, they use sulfates like copper sulfate and zinc oxide. What Dr. Spears found is that that they have a negative impact on rumen bacteria. Sure. Think about it. If you, when your horse sure. um, gets a wound, what do you spray in that wound to kill bacteria? Copper sulfate. Yeah, or an oxide. What do people use in dairy foot baths to kill bacteria in the hoof of the cow? Copper sulfate. What does 98% of, of uh, the companies use to cheapen up their mineral package copper sulfate and i'm like <laughs> guys you know and, and so folks that are focusing on soil health i i get a lot of pushback from them that, no we don't want mineral and i and i'm like i i know what you're saying you're saying to me you want mineral but you don't want that negative or interruption to the symbiosis so I just wanted to make that clear to anybody listening to this is we are very, very, very focused on having mineral that is healthy or, or, or friendly for the rumen bacteria. We always say feed the troops that win the war. So good for the good, good bugs and fungi in the rumen. But furthermore, 
good for the bugs or the rumen, um, pop, uh, sorry, the, the microbe population in the soil. <laughs> so. Right. Well, those are things that we'll learn more as we go along over time and years. There's just no yes. doubt about any of them. The other thing, yeah, it's just so fascinating is that in order to really make grass-fed cattle finish, you need to have a carbon-nitrogen ratio in the rumen because it'll create the same bugs as, not the same as corn, but they'll have the same effect on the gas in the rumen to make cattle finish. And wow. until we learned about the carbon deal, we were just, sometimes they'd finish, sometimes they wouldn't, but once you understand that there needs to be like a, and I think it's a, somebody that's smarter than I'm, probably 35, 65 relationship between carbon and nitrogen. And then 35% is the carbon to make the mat for the nitrogen to lay on, to mix the molecules, to make the gas. It's an easy yeah. deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, it it kind of comes back to what I was saying, is feed the troops that win the war. The troops in this case are your rumen, your, your rumen microbes. They're doing all the work of breaking down this grass. They're doing all the work of breaking down the forages. And right. it's, it, if we take care of them and provide a, a healthy, wholesome, sorry. If you don't disrupt them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which, which I think we, we're, um, we're learning as we go here, Bob, but in the livestock industry, we're pretty good at disrupting things. Um, <laughs> we, we're not trying to, we're just doing it because maybe dad did it and grandpa did it before him, you know, but what you're saying is a whole new way of thinking and I love it. It's, it's a win-win approach. Um, symbiosis is something we can study in nature. Um, there's many examples of it and I think we need to live it in, uh, in our, in our ranching operations. It's very, very possible. Right. And we didn't make it economical. Everything at the end of the day has to pay for itself. Sure. We can feel as good as we want, but you still have to eat. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right, Trevor. Well, I just wanted to mostly get that deal in there about them farmers because I just felt horrible after I thought through what we talked about because they are such a huge part of what we Sure. Do. Sure. With that, we'll sign out. Thanks, Trevor. Thank Have you, Bob. Day. Yep. Yeah. Thank you.